You're listening to The Wealth Advocates with finance experts John Mickelson and Patrick Jenkins. The Wealth Advocates simplify the financial world and show you how today's events could affect your financial health so you feel confident about your financial future. Good afternoon, Wealth Advocates Nation. We're so excited to have you back here. And more exciting is we've got Robert Spenlove, economist for Zions Bank and Utah State Senator. So he has access points, all kinds of information. Robert, thanks for being with us again. We're excited about your influence and your information. What is going on? Today we hit an all-time 40-year high in inflation. The Fed's doing all kinds of things. Walk us through what you see happening in the economy. Okay. Well, thanks. It's great to be with you. Um, You know, we're in a period of transition. Bottom line is, uh, you know, the economy is still driven by COVID. It has been driven by COVID for the last two years. And even though it's looking better, there's these distortions that were caused because it was so big. And so trying to keep up with those distortions is really difficult. So if you look at what the Fed is doing, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, will be meeting next week. Uh, they uh, have been in a pathway of increasing interest rates. Uh, started that in June with a 25 basis point increase. Uh, and then they, uh, in their last meeting, they raised at 50 basis points, uh, kind of coming off that zero level. Um, what's really interesting is if you look at what the Fed, how the Fed has pivoted over the last year, the Fed went from literally one year ago, they said in 2022, they were not going to change interest rates at all. They were going to keep it at zero through this entire year. Now they're saying that they're going to raise uh, interest rates uh, by uh, up to around 2 to 3% over the next year. That, but then if you look at what markets expect, you know, what's interesting, markets are better at predicting what the Fed is going to do than the Fed is at predicting what they're going to do. <laughs> and so markets say that by December of this year, the Fed funds rate will be at 2.84%. By a year from now, it'll be over 3%. So the, the markets think that the Fed is going to have to get really aggressive in what they do with their interest rates. And then the second, uh, so the Fed kind of has two parts. They have interest rates and then they have their balance sheet. Mm-hmm. Um, balance sheet is a kind of a new tool that the Fed's really never used. Um, it really only started to be used uh, during the Great Recession. And the Fed, uh, one of the ways to fight the Great Recession that was they went on the secondary market and they bought securities. And if you look, um, in green is mortgage-backed securities, and in blue is treasury securities. That's what they've been buying for the last 20 years. Um, and so th- they've just kept increasing the size of this balance sheet over and over and over again. Um, and just in the last two years, it went from $4 trillion to over $9 trillion in the balance sheet. And that essentially supported the, the, uh, the uh, housing market and Treasury securities are used to fund business growth. So, you know, if you kind of think about the growth in the tech sector, a lot of that was driven by uh, uh, cheap borrowing costs. Yeah. So the Fed has literally just last week started pulling back on their on their balance sheet. They've started to allow it to go down. So they're pulling back that support. So number one, they're raising interest rates. And then number two, they're pulling back on their balance sheet. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, the Fed has never really done this before. They've never uh, significantly, significantly sent their, the size of their balance sheet. So we don't know exactly what is going to happen, exactly what that impact is going to be. So that's one of those sources of uncertainty right now with the Fed. So a couple of questions on that. One is, in case you said the two tools, one's interest rates and the other one's the balance sheet. How much leeway do they have? I mean, when they talk about here are the tools they have to work with with where we are, how much how much latitude do they have to say, hey, we can do more, we can do more? So the, the Fed can do as much as they want, um, but the struggle is there's a lag in their actions and how the economy responds. Now, markets respond really quickly. Um, uh, the, 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 the markets, of uh, essentially the bond market is already priced in a lot of these assumptions mm-hmm. for the, the Fed balance sheet. But the economy takes a lot longer to respond. And so this is one of the struggles that Jerome Powell is running into, is 
the, the, the economy isn't reflecting what they've done. And traditionally what the Fed has done is they've gone very slowly to assess the impact on the economy. But they can't do it this time because of the, the struggles that we're seeing with inflation. Yeah. And so, so, you know, there's a push for them to get really aggressive right now. Um, but that, so it, if you think about what's caused the current situation we're in, most recessions are caused by Fed policy mistakes. And if you think about over the last year, uh, the Fed has made a number of mistakes. Um, number one, they misread inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, they just got it wrong. They said it was temporary. They said it was limited. Um, the second part, the second mistake they made is they took too long to respond. You know, they, they could have responded six months ago. They could have responded nine months ago. And they only started with inflation or with interest rates in March and with the balance sheet a week ago. And so then the, the third potential mistake, and this is what we're watching, is do they overreact or do they underreact? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's going to be the tough part. So how fast they move versus gradual movement. And yeah. arguably, they've come too late to the game anyway. I mean, most of this economy has been driven by energy. Most of the energy problems have been driven by political policy. The Fed seems to be trying to keep up. Is that accurate or is that do you read that differently? No, that's totally accurate. I, I think the Fed has now pivoted. You know, they, they were very dovish for way too long. Uh -huh. But just uh, just earlier, just a few days ago, Janet Yellen finally said, mm -hmm. you yep, know, two we, days ago. we never yeah. should have used the word tra transitory. Yep. You know, we never, we should, we should have taken this more seriously. So they're pivoting, um, but can they do enough to counteract what we're seeing? And that's or the biggest are they problem. adding to the problem? Because we have this weird phenomena of, Everybody has a help wanted ad out there. Everybody, they, there seems to be a level of dissatisfaction and unemployment as well. Mm -hmm. And now the Fed is kind of raising interest rates on top of really high uh, energy prices. Everything in the world seems to be far more expensive. Are they going to cause impacts, negative impacts in the economy rather than fixing some of the inflationary indexes? So this is the struggle. Um, the, there, there's a very real chance that the Fed will push us into a recession. Um, and, you know, recession means that we have slower growth, mm -hmm. uh, means that we have higher unemployment. It, you know, it, but, but the, the alternative, though, is hyperinflation. You know, the alternative is that we see that inflation. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, uh, our next slide, if you're okay. I mean, if, if you look at where our inflation is, um, we're at 8.6%. Uh, we were the, the, the kind of the expectation was that inflation had peaked and that we would start to see it going down. What we saw with the latest inflation number was a complete surprise. So the, the analogy that I'm looking at, if you look over at the far left side of that screen, so everyone keeps talking about, you know, that it's the highest since 1981, which is accurate. But that was the period of inflation coming down. If you yeah. look over into the 1970s, you can see a bunch of false peaks in that inflation. So here's the fear. Here's my fear is that last month we may, see, we may have seen a false peak and that inflation is now ticking up. And what's to say that inflation doesn't get to, you know, 10, 12, 14 percent. And that's the biggest fear of the Fed. You know, the biggest fear is those asset bubbles and then when those bubbles pop, you uh, the, the only thing worse than hyperinflation is deflation. And essentially, when those asset bubbles pop and you start to see price losses. And so the Fed is willing to risk a recession in order to prevent what happened in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to keep going? Keep going. Yes. Okay. So, I like where you're at. <laughs> so kind of zooming in on that inflation, uh, because... Uh, you know, and you can really see that kind of false peak where that inflation um, uh, accelerated uh, in the last month from 8.3% to 8.6%. The other, and this is kind of getting into the weeds, but I included the table um, from, the, from the release. Look at that month to month. It's the top line. The prior month was three-tenths of a percent. 
Uh, the expectation was that it would be seven. It was, came in at 1%. If you annualize the last month, that's 12% inflation. So, so we see that the inflation is accelerating. Um, if we look at, uh, uh, on the next slide, if we look at our region, uh, while the nation is 8.6%, the mountain region is 9.4%. Yeah. So we're even higher. Um, the reason for that, uh, you know, one of our, uh, one of the things the Fed does is they strip out food and fuel. Okay, so okay. pause for a second. Yep. Why would we do that? Why would we strip out food and fuel? Because are we not going to eat and drive? I know. It's crazy. <laughs> but whether we like it or not, okay, so the Fed's argument is that Food and fuel are too volatile, and so we need to look at core. We need to strip out food and fuel to see what the underlying demand is and what the underlying inflation is. But I agree with you. We're all paying for food, and we're that all paying for fuel. That is the primary thing. Yeah. So if food costs more, if gas costs more, what does it matter on anything else? <laughs> just, uh, just stop driving and I eating. Know. You'll it, be fine. Yeah, it, it, that's all you have to do. <laughs> um, but it is the, the Fed does focus on that core, and so that's why. I threw it in there. Um, and the Fed's target, of course, is 2%. So they want, you know, and they're willing to accept inflation up to 3%, whereas it right now it's at 6% nationally. Yeah. So it's three times their goal. In our region, 7.7, so we're nearly four times. Just with that core, just stripping out food and fuel. But then if you look at food prices, um, again, they accelerated uh, nationwide up 10%. In our region, nearly 10%. Um, and then digging into it one level further, you can really see the driver of that uh, that food inflation. Meat, poultry, fish, and eggs in the U.S. up 14%. In our region, up nearly 20%. So we're, we're really seeing the pressure. Um, you know, things like... I mean, and these are still, you know, staples. Uh, uh, bacon prices are way up. Um, but, you know, really just across the board. And then... One of the things that I've been looking at, so, you know, this is kind of digging into the why. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, um, between the two of them, Russia and Ukraine produce 12% of all calories consumed in the world. So they have a big impact. So you, and, and if you look at this graph of wheat prices, you see that, that you know, the prices were actually dropping uh, from 2013 into 2017, uh, we started to see if you if you kind of look at mid 2020, you start to see those that those wheat prices starting to creep up. That's the beginning of that inflation. Um, so the inflation was pre uh, Ukraine war, but then look at you know uh, just a few months ago, be beginning of 22, that uh, that price spikes, and now we're stuck at that higher level. So and and if you think about wheat. Even if you're not directly eating wheat, which we all are, um, but it goes into the production of all other food products. Mm -hmm. And so it has an impact throughout, uh, throughout food. Uh, looking at energy, um, energy prices are, are also way up. Uh, we did see a little bit of a downtick in, uh, in our region, but downtick to 29%. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's still very high. And in the U.S., uh, those uh, prices accelerated. Um, that we're, we're seeing, uh, there was one kind of the, of the sub energy indicators uh, that saw the highest uh, annual price increase that the uh, labor department has ever measured. They mentioned that in their uh, in their press release on that. So we're seeing that high pressure, and that's really being caused, you know, by those increases in oil. Um, you know, there, there's a number of reasons why this... So this is one of the struggles with the current situation. Well, there is a single cause, but that one single cause is COVID. But, you know, if it, there's several sub-causes that are going on. The war in Ukraine, uh, 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 the supply chain struggles in China, uh, lack of production in America, um, increased demand because people are coming back in. So it's really hard to pinpoint one cause to bring that back down. Mm -hmm. And so we just see that pressure continuing to build higher and higher. Uh, oil prices now at $120 a barrel, um, up significantly from where it was you know, just last year or two years ago. And so that continues to pressure that. Um, one interesting thing, though, about gas prices 
is we are at an all-time high uh, in uh, yeah, kind of in the Utah area. Uh, we're right around five dollars a, a gallon mm-hmm. um, on an inflation adjusted. Or if you look at real gas prices, um, our our highest is actually five fifty a gallon. So it it is painful and it does feel bad. But we're not actually at a, 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 an inflation adjusted or a real all time high. I think you need to unpack prices. that just a little okay. bit more because gas prices are high, but real gas prices, walk me through that a little bit more so, in detail. So, back in 2008, uh, in fact, if you look back before 2014, the price of oil was uh, just about $105 yeah. a barrel. Yep. And before that period, so the way you look at real prices, is you say, what's the price? And then you adjust it for inflation. And so, you know, if, if you think about your grandpa talking about how gas was 35 cents a gallon when he was sure. a kid, that's what they're talking about, you know, because that's not inflation adjusted. So that would be the nominal price. Mm-hmm. But the real price of something is saying, okay, what was the price? And then what was the inflation uh, to account for that? So if we inflation adjust those, that gas price, <clears throat> that's how we get to 550 gallons. And so you're saying the 2013 real price was higher? Is that what you... The 2008. Eight, 2008. Yep. 2008, 2008 you know. inflation yeah. adjusted was higher than it is today. I see. Okay. Um, but that, you know, that's easy to say, but it still hurts. <laughs> it still hurts to yeah. pay $5 yeah. a gallon. In California, they're paying $7 a gallon. Well, and it's the change. I mean, it's, it's such a dramatic change from what we were used to. So we're adjusting. I mean, people budget, and you say, this is what I'm accustomed to. And then even if it, it does adjust up to where normal prices might have been, taking that adjustment so quickly, people can't react, uh, at least with their own budgets, that dramatically so quickly. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And um, the, the, someone referred to inflation as the most regressive tax. You know, it, it, yeah. it hurts everyone, right? And it's painful for everyone, but it really hurts the low income. It really yeah. hurts people on fixed incomes. Um, you know, there are, uh, it's like virtually impossible to make substitutes. You, you can't entirely substitute food, right? I mean, you can get cheaper food, but you still have to eat. Mm-hmm. And you can, you know, you can drive less, but you still rely on that energy to mm-hmm. live. And so, it, and it just saps away resources from those that are in the toughest, per- uh, toughest economic situation. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at housing. Uh, we continue to see uh, uh, housing price appreciation. Um, now, one of the struggles with the, the inflation numbers that the, that the Fed uses is they don't consider the purchase of a home to be inflation because it's, a, it's an investment rather than a consumption. And so their indicator tends to underrepresent what's really happening. But even with that said, um, you know, the, their, their uh, housing inflation... Uh, is again three times the the overall um, the or the target, and in our region it's at ten percent, so really high. Now, if we do look at the actual home prices, and I threw in Idaho just because Idaho is a really interesting uh, comparison to Utah as well. Um, so nationwide, uh, housing prices are above or closing in on three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars in Idaho, four hundred seventy five thousand in Utah. Over five hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the average home price. I mean, you compare that to the Great Recession, where you know, you know, if you think about the housing bubble, what was the housing bubble? It was two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. You know, now we're at five hundred and fifty thousand. It's it's becoming uh, very difficult uh, to find affordable housing. Yeah. So then you look at wage growth and things like that. How do people pay for that price tag? How can they get into an average home? I mean, if incomes don't rise enough, you, you, you can't. I mean, that's what's going to slow it down. That's exactly right. Now, the way that people were able to do it in the last few years was ultra low interest rates. Right. So if your interest rate is really low, you can afford to make uh, or you, you can uh, your, your payment can afford to buy more house. Mm-hmm. But with those rates going up, it kind of reverses that. Now. One of the things to point out, though, this is not, you know, it's like they say in computer programming, uh, this is not a bug, it's a design. I mean, the the Fed is (laughs) doing this on purpose. The Fed is trying. In fact, if you look at the the next slide, you know, this is the Fed's fear. 
And if you look back at the housing bubble, you know, we had these really high uh, appreciations in, in homes. And then what happened in 2009 uh, and 10 and 11 was that bubble popped and that housing market collapsed and we saw, you know, the impact of the Great Recession. So the, the, the Fed is trying to stop this bubble or deflate this bubble. And the way they do that is with higher interest rates. So the Fed's goal, the Fed's hope is, I mean, so just look over on the right. I mean, uh, uh, Utah is still at 30% housing price appreciation. That's the latest data. It hasn't slowed down yet. Uh, U.S. is at 20%. But look at Idaho. Idaho topped out at 37% housing price appreciation. This is back in the fall. And now they've hit that peak and they're slowing, or I should say decelerating uh -huh. uh, aggressively and now down to 21%. Um, that's what I see happening. If you kind of look at the Great Recession, Idaho preceded Utah in its trend. So I think we are at a peak for Utah housing price appreciation. Um, the big question now is you know how much will that housing market slow? Will it will the appreciation just slow, or will we see a drop in prices? And it's too soon to tell. I think there are strong arguments that the housing market in Utah will hold up because uh, we have uh, a, you know really strong demand, really strong uh, in migration into the state, and we continue to have a shortage of housing in our state. Uh, at, at the peak, or at the you know the worst point two years ago, we had a shortage of about forty thousand units. Right now, it's at twenty thousand. So we're down from that, but we've still got way more demand than supply. So that should support that market, but we should see a slowing. Well, and I think another ma major factor in that is it's not just people moving to residents; it's like businesses moving to Utah, and that brings huge numbers of people looking for reasonably nice homes. Yeah, and that's one that's of the masses. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of the uh, of the of the Utah market, the Utah economy is uh, Utah has had a very strong uh, uh, solid growing market for a long time and that actually supports uh, greater business growth. You know, businesses want to come to Utah because they know that it's a good place to operate and good good place to find a good workforce. Yeah. Um, if we look at uh, so just kind of to your point, you know, the, the impact of higher mortgage rates. Um, uh, it, so just looking, this is an analysis the uh, Financial Times did. That rate going from three percent to over five percent equates to an a, a monthly payment that is five to six hundred dollars a month higher. Mm -hmm. So it has a you know, so you look at the, the, the gas price increases, the food price increases. Now we've got mortgage increases. It's just eating up that uh, discretionary income that people have. Can you have. take a second and translate federal rates to mortgage rates? Because when people hear, okay, the Fed is working toward a 3% rate, yep. that doesn't mean quite as much as what a mortgage rate might mean. So maybe you can spend a little bit of time telling us about that. Sure. Um, and, and there's not... Well, there is an indirect relationship um, between what the Fed does and those rates. Um, so the Fed only controls the very shortest term rate, it's sure. called the federal funds rate, and it's the overnight rate. Um, <clears throat> but then through, the, uh, uh, through their balance sheet, they have more influence on that mortgage market because they're yeah. buying mortgage-backed securities and uh, treasury securities. Um, but probably the most closely aligned uh, uh, interest rate would be the uh, the the ten year uh, bond rate, and the ten year bond rate real is essentially used to set mortgage rates, and so and it's generally I mean again this changes, but mortgage rates are generally about two percent above the ten year. Mm -hmm. So if the ten year is at three percent, then you know that's why mortgage rates are around five percent. So that's one of the indicators that I watch really closely is that 10-year. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, what have we seen? I mean, the 10-year has been sticking right around that 3%. Um, with the, with the uh, inflation uh, surprise from today, uh, the 10-year has become pretty volatile. And it, uh, last I checked, it was kind of starting to go above 3%. So that, that may push those mortgage rates higher. The other thing, like I said, there is we don't know what the impact of the Fed selling off their mortgage-backed securities is going to be. 
I mean, that it should um, cause mortgage rates to go up more. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't know to what degree and the exact effect that will be. But I think at least in the intermediate term, um, we may see higher mortgage rates. Um, I don't see any support, at least at this point, for those rates going down in the near future. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at, so kind of a, a, a one of the reasons that we're seeing that inflation, I'll just hit this, this one real quick, is producers are seeing their prices go up. Um, so we were looking at consumer prices, but producer prices are way up. And, you know, they are really struggling under, under the pressure of these higher prices. And they can only absorb so much of this pressure until they have to pass that along. And producer prices are also uh, above 10%. Um, one other interesting thing, you know, kind of to the point that the Fed, it wasn't just the Fed. Um, you know, there were a lot of people that got it wrong. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jerome Powell finally said it recently. He said, forecasters need to be more humble. And, <laughs> you, know, and, and you know, what we saw was as these uh, inflation rates just kept going up, their forecast kept saying, and it'll go back to 2%. Well, now it's 4%, but it'll go down to 2 And now it's at 6 but it'll go down to 2 And the whole way up, they were wrong. And so, you know, this is where, you know, in markets, you talk about capitulation. Mm -hmm. You're finally starting to see some capitulation among central bankers. And they're saying, you know what? We're not going back to 2% anytime soon. Now they're starting to revise their forecast and they're saying, we're hoping we can get down to 4%. But we're in we're in for a longer period of higher inflation, and the Fed is struggling to get that inflation under control. And it's just something we, we're probably going to be dealing with for the you know for the next. Uh, uh, it could be several months to a few years mm. of uh, of higher inflationary environment, and that's just reflected. The University of Michigan does a survey. Uh, they've been doing this for fifty years. One of the questions they ask is of consumers. Where do you expect inflation to be? And what's really interesting is inflation expectations drive inflation, right? So people expect it to be higher. Self-fulfilling. Exactly. (laughs) And so you see that people expect in the survey, they expect inflation to be 5% a year from now. So I think that's a pretty accurate um, uh, indicator that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to see this high inflation and then just have it drop back down to two. Mm -hmm. We're in for a period of, of, of higher price increases. Um, so looking at the labor market, so this is this is that kind of disconnect, right? Yep, um, right here. Because you look at the labor market. This is the economy. The economy is doing great. And, you know, that the, we had 390,000 jobs added in the last month. The unemployment rate dropped to 3.6%. We're nearly back to where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, you look at... Uh, the labor force participation rate. People are coming back in the labor market, um, but the, the the labor participation rate, I think, is one of the 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 main indicators of the struggles that we're seeing. So even with the unemployment rate near a a, a fifty year low, um, before the pandemic, the labor participation rate was sixty three point three percent. Where is it now? Sixty two point three. So what that shows you is even with this really tight labor market, with all, uh, all this demand, people are still sitting on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. People are not coming back in. And you look back to 2000, the, the labor participation rate was 67%. So this is the reason that we have that labor shortage. This is the reason that the economy is struggling so bad right now uh, because people just won't come back into the labor market. Mm-hmm. And there's a combination of, of reasons for this. A big part is, uh, uh, so uh, we had a long-term trend of the baby boomers retiring. And yeah. the pandemic kind of forced that trend forward. We saw a big uh, drop in that participation as a lot of people left the labor force to retire. So the w- now here's the problem. Here's where it gets ugly. Um, and, you know, Jerome Powell said this. He said, you know, we can fix this, but it's not going to be pretty. See, that's, this is what I'm wondering about this graph. Does it take into consideration generational demographics? Remember in the Clinton campaign, what they say about our generation? We're all Gen X, I think. Yeah. So they said, you know, the baby boomers were real big participants. And then why can't we get Gen X to participate? 
were much smaller, yeah. like to the tune of 22% smaller. And right now we're kind of peaking, whereas there's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single year. Day, COVID, every day. Every day, sorry. That's what I meant. <laughs> Even worse. 10,000 a day. <laughs> and then COVID kind of slowed the uh, millennial Gen Z group coming online. And so when you say that there's 62% labor force participation, do we even have as many uh, people that could work at this point that are in working uh, phases, I guess, is, is a better way to phrase that. So it depends on your definition of being able to work, right? I mean, we have, we as a society have defined um, uh, whether you're ready for work differently than they did in past generations. Sure. A hundred years ago, your 10-year-old was working right. and your 95-year-old mother was working. And now we say, well, you know, you have to be in perfect condition, perfect this, perfect that. Uh-huh. And everyone's stepping away from the labor force. And it's, it's a sign of our economic prosperity. Um, and so it, this actually is a sign of a really strong economy that people don't need to work. So that is at, a great analysis. At an yeah. Ind- <laughs> yeah, at an individual level, it's great. But at a societal level, we're seeing the problems. We're seeing the struggles at the, at the grocery store or at the, uh, the fast food store or the, uh, the, the restaurant because we don't have this labor. And ultimately, this uh, labor shortage causes some real problems. Um, now, the way to get these people to come back in. So here's the problem. Here's where it's going to be painful. Uh, okay. So right now in America... Uh, people have $2 trillion saved left over from the pandemic support. You know, we got the direct payments. We got the unemployment insurance benefits, the PPP, all that stuff. They stuck it in their bank accounts and they've been sitting on it ever since. So that $2 trillion will last for another about six to nine months. Once that money runs out, those people are going to say, I need to work. And so what it's going to mean, I mean, this is where it's painful. Those people that retired early are going to have to come back, back into the workforce. Those uh, dual-income households where one of the, uh, the parents said, you know, I don't need to work anymore, mm-hmm. they're going to have to come back in again. And that's the only way on a societal level, on an economic aggregate level, to fix it, but it's going to be painful at the individual level. I was going to also say, on that demographic discussion, the, the, the completion of that picture is, yes, we have the, the, the baby boomers, big, huge group, Gen X or small group. Well, the other thing is the millennials. That's a big group. Yeah. The millennials and, save Social Security. They're going to save us, right? The greatest scheme in the world. See, we need everybody criticizes the millennials. I'm saying, hey, they're going to save us. Anyway, but, but back to what we were saying, you know, one of the things is, you know, we look at it and say there's certain jobs that are hard jobs. And because of our prosperity, you know, it's, it's hard for, for us. It's like me saying, I want my kids to have it better than I have it. Yeah. Well, there's some of those jobs that aren't better. And who's going to fill those jobs? And that's the challenge is if we have cash on the sidelines, that takes away from the incentive to say, hey, we've got to fill those and people will come and do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so it, 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 it will take kind of a paradigm shift. I mean, you know, jobs that our kids won't do, we, oh, someone has to do them. Either, either we have to do it through artificial t- intelligence, and that is a big part. Yeah. Technological advances sure. taking care of a lot of that. Um, th- another one of the big trends is we've been outsourcing it to other parts of the world. Or immigration. Or immigration. And But you, you think about all these are difficult problems. So just one of the big economic trends right now is onshoring. Right, we're, yeah. we were relying on just in time something coming from China getting here, and you know we enjoy the benefits of it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's now breaking down. Yeah. Right, uh, Shanghai uh, just got put back into lockdown today, oh. so we thought it was going to get fixed, and now they locked it back down. Um, and then you know, so just in time just isn't working anymore. And so, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be bringing those jobs back into that production back into America. Um, we're going to be, you know, needing even more labor to meet this. But the other thing that we're going to see is the reason a lot of that production was in China is because it was more efficient and cheaper. Mm-hmm. So what we're going to see as we start to bring these resources back into America, lower efficiency, 
and higher prices. Mm -hmm. So that's where we see this longer period. Uh, we really were kind of in a Cinderella period. And now we're going to see a period of higher inflation and less, uh, less efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, looking at kind of the, like, uh, the, the last part of the labor market is that wage growth. Now, this is, an, th this is actually a, a more positive sign uh, where that wage growth is finally starting to, to taper off a little bit. Um, one of my biggest fears earlier this year was something called the wage price spiral. And this is what happened in the 1970s, where you saw prices going up. So employers had to pay increasingly higher wages. But then because they have to, uh, you know, they have to uh, maintain their profit margins, mm -hmm. they increase their prices even more. So, the, so higher wages are chasing higher prices. And that's what caused the out-of-control inflation of the 1970s. So to see that starting to come down is a good sign. But the other side of the coin... So remember, 5.2% uh, wage growth, the inflation is still over 8%. So real wages are dropping. So people are getting further and further behind, even with these big wage increases. Ultimately, what we need is for both the wages and the inflation to come down. If you look at that long-term wage growth, 2.8% um, building, you know, with 2% inflation, that's a great scenario. Yeah. Where you have low wage growth, low inflation, but the wages are growing faster than the prices. Mm -hmm. That's what the Fed is trying to get us back to, but it's a tough situation right now. Yeah. Um, looking at kind of regionally, um, you know, one of the explanation for the really high inflation, higher inflation in our region than the rest of the country is our, our economy continues to be the strongest and the best in the country. Uh, second fastest growing state in the country uh, in terms of population over the last year. Uh, if you look over the last 10 years, we're the fastest, Utah was the fastest growing state in the country. The nature of that growth, um, what's really interesting is traditionally 60% of, uh, of our population growth was from natural increase or our, our own kids and grandkids. Um, last year, it was 60% migration. So we're flipping that mm -hmm. because uh, Utah is such a, a, a strong market and attracting so many people. Uh, if we look at where that population is growing, um, in the last year, the, kind of the big growing counties were Utah and Washington. But this, you can see that, uh, that uh, uh, effect of really high housing prices is pushing people off to the periphery. So now our highest growing were Iron County and Tooele County. So uh, you also see the what we call a donut effect, mm -hmm. where you have relatively lower growth in Salt Lake, but much higher growth uh, on those uh, counties that where you can access those urban amenities, but have more of the mm -hmm. um, suburban. Is that, is that number surprising to you, or is it kind of not? For Salt Lake? <laughs> yeah, for Salt Lake. You know, it, it is... Uh, that's actually pretty good growth for an urban area. And, you know, a lot of that growth is happening in the southwestern portion of Salt Lake County. Yeah. Um, but the, the urban core is, is pretty stable. I mean, but the one that is surprising and just amazing to me is Utah County, 2.9%. Utah County um, will surpass Salt Lake County in the next 20 years as the largest county in the state. Hmm. And they just continue to see very strong, very high growth. Uh, you just drive down the I-15 corridor yeah, and you can yeah. see that growth going on. Um, and a lot of that is because of the, you know, the emergencies, emergency of Silicon Slopes and the tech sector. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at employment, so <clears throat> one of the things we are seeing is employment growth in Utah is slowing down. We're now uh, on a year-over-year -year basis. Our employment growth is lower than the national average. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, a, a, a longer-term perspective, it helps explain why that happened. So if you look from February of 2020 to the latest data, Utah is actually the fastest growing state. So what, what you saw is those states that kind of uh, emerged early out of the pandemic or their economies opened up earlier, saw a real spurt in growth. And then those states that lagged um, are seeing the growth later on. So we, saw, we see Utah, Idaho, uh, uh, Texas, Florida seeing real high growth uh, early on. But now, um, you know, states like uh, Nevada and California is, uh, and New York are starting to catch up. Um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, or during that two-month period when we saw the big contraction, Utah lost 232,000, or sorry, 140,000 jobs. 
But since then, we've gained 232,000. So remember, the nationally, we're still we're uh, not even back up to our pre-pandemic employment level. Utah is much above that, so doing really well. All sectors have grown in the last year, uh, led by trade, transportation, utilities, and also leisure and hospitality. Again, sectors that were lagging are now leading. Um, when you look at where the uh, employment is growing, again, uh, Tooele County really jumps out, 5.8% uh, employment growth. But then again, Utah County growing up 5%, so really strong uh, employment growth in a lot of parts of the state. Uh, we only saw three counties that contracted over the last year, and that was Daggett, Wayne, and Garfield. Um, if we look at the unemployment rate, so this is part of the reason, too, that that employment growth in Utah is starting to slow, uh, is we've got the lowest unemployment rate in the country, tied with Nebraska. 1.9% um, is extremely low unemployment. Um, and when you look at it by county, you see that there are some counties that have even lower uh, Utah County at 1.6, Davis at 1.7, Cash 1.6, and then Juab County 1.4. I mean, that is essentially zero. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. it's it, that that actually starts to strain the economy because that unemployment rate is so low, and that that it does it constrains the ability of the economy to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and then just looking at it over time, it is that 1.9 percent is the lowest unemployment uh, rate that our state has ever seen. Um, but then kind of bringing in that labor participation, this is a positive sign for Utah, which is while the nation uh, is struggling to kind of get that participation back, Utah has a much higher participation rate and it's recovering much better than, uh, than the overall nation did. Um, and then just kind of putting them all together, like I said, COVID is still driving the economy. You know, whether we like it or not, uh, it's having a big impact in China, it's having a... Uh, these kind of uh, ripple effects in our economy. But I think I, I do see a positive outlook there. Our, our economic growth is still positive. And, you know, and I think it will be positive, uh, you know, at least for the next several months. Job creation is good. Our unemployment rate is low. Uh, that wage growth is moderating, which I think is a good thing as long as we can get that inflation down too. Um, that labor force participation is coming up. Um, one of our struggle areas, though, consumer confidence is low. You know, that inflation really has a big impact on consumer confidence. Uh, and that inflation we were hoping was peaking, but now we see it going up again. Mm -hmm. So we so we don't know how much higher that's going to uh, kind of charge. Home prices, I think, are peaking too, but we don't have enough data yet. But um, the, even if they are peaking, it's still too high, and that appreciation is too much. Um, and then interest rates are going to continue to go up. They have to go up to, to fight that inflation, but it'll also have a, a negative imp a impact on the overall economy. Well, I think in summary, I think there's a mixed data, but the fears are pretty apparent, meaning the interest rates, the inflation rates, and kind of, but we're in a pretty good spot compared to most of the rest of the nation of is that fair to say? Utah is really well positioned. Um, so th this is my, my well, I've been through three recessions in my career. And I kind of think about, you know, all three of those. Um, uh, the, the last one I really don't even count. I mean, it was, it was all COVID and it was just, you know, we'll never see that again. Um, but the last, you know, the one before that, the Great Recession, coming out of that recession that Utah emerged as the strongest state in the country. So I think Utah continues to be really well positioned. Um, we, you know, uh, both financially in our state, our business climate, our uh, demographics, our fundamentals are really strong. So I think we're well positioned. See, and I think that that's really an important aspect of where, where it comes back to us and it comes back to a client is there's a lot to consider. And one of the things I think is most important is behavior. Behavior is so critical in what we do for a client. It, it, not overreacting, but reacting when we should. And so for those that, you know, watch this, I hope that's a driver is to come and say, where am I really? And make it go back to your priorities. What do you care about? What are we doing this for? And then let that drive the decisions we make and not let fear and speculation be the deciding factors in it. So in closing, thank you for coming again. We sure. really appreciate having you come and giving this perspective on where things are. I think a lot of times we get caught up in what we see only in the media 
which ties in usually to one thing or two things instead of the broader perspective of maybe 15 or 20. Yeah. So again, we hope that this helps with everyone that observes or watches. And thank you again for, uh, for being here with us. It's great to be with you. Robert. Thanks. Thank you for listening to The Wealth Advocates. Join us every month by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. You can also look for The Wealth Advocates on Stitcher and YouTube. Want more information about today's topics? Reach out to John or Patrick directly by calling or texting The Wealth Advocates office at 435-754-7888. Learn more about The Wealth Advocates and how they can help you by visiting www.wealth-advocates.com. Securities offered through registered representatives of Cambridge Investment Research Incorporated, a broker-dealer member, FINRA, SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors Incorporated, a registered investment advisor. Wealth Advocates and Cambridge Investment Research Incorporated are not affiliated.